continues to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. And could I thank the Reverend McKee for his very kind invitation along this week to conduct these Bible studies. I hope you're having a happy Free Presbyterian Day, March the 17th. Some people call it Patrick's Day. We call it Happy Free Presbyterian Day because in 1951, 73 years ago, the first Free Presbyterian congregation was formed. Of course, I do love Patrick's Day as well, but Patrick, as I'm sure you all know, was the apostle to Ulster. There's no evidence he went to the, what we now call Southern Ireland. And he taught what the apostles taught and what we preach tonight. And there's no better way to honor Patrick than this evening to do as he did to study the Word of God. He wasn't a Roman Catholic. I'm sure you all know that. Roman Catholics weren't in Ireland the centuries after Patrick had died. And under his, in the early Irish church, missionaries went throughout the rest of Europe. Uh, Ireland became the center of really gospel witness at those early centuries. And we thank God for that. And thank God we're preaching the same gospel. But we're here tonight to think of the church at Ephesus. Before I start in verse 1, Just to give you the background, you can read it in Acts 19. Paul came to this city, a very large city, about the size of Greater Belfast, the main city in that particular area. It was a city with a great temple, one of the seven wonders of the world at that time, the temple to Diana, the mother goddess. Remember the people cried out, great is Diana of the Ephesians. So it was a very wicked city with all that immorality and evil that went on with that false worship of the mother goddess. And then also it was a city given over, as I said, to sin. Uh, I had the occasion a few years ago, my wife and I were over three times preaching in Singapore, weeks of meetings, Malaysia, Indonesia, for the Reverend Paul Ferguson. And he suggested when you come, go through Turkish Airlines. And then we did that, the church paid us out, which was nice, but we made our own way to Ephesus. Some of you may have been there, it's fantastic. The ruins are there. We walked on the same pavement that Paul walked. We saw the theater mentioned in Acts 19, holding about 25,000 people. Now, I mean an amphitheater. You know, the stone steps up. It's absolutely amazing. The ruins of the library, the ruins of houses. You see just a few pillars of where this great temple of Diana stood. But Paul is writing to these believers, many of whom were actual slaves, poor. Remember slavery, 35% or more of the population were slaves in those days. Some would have been in the congregation. So Paul's writing to encourage them. If you read the book, the first three chapters, he's telling them doctrine. And in chapter four to six, your duty. What to believe and then how to behave. And uh, always need to get who we are first so that we'll know how to live as we should. And it is a wonderful book known as the church epistle. And he calls the church a temple. Not, not the temple like Diana's gone, but we're a spiritual temple, the spiritual body, the spiritual bride of Christ. But it's a wonderful book. I better start reading it here uh, in it. They had a sports stadium, by the way, held about 50,000. <laughs> You think stadium's big today, but uh, so don't think of these books as if they're, uh, you know, these churches or t- letters as if they're away in the midst of time. We can know a lot about the situation in which they lived, and it's very similar to our own. Let's read a few verses from chapter one. Remember, this is a letter. Can you imagine this being read to the congregation? Just as you're sitting here tonight, many of them couldn't read or write, so an elder or pastor would have read it. Chapter 1 of Ephesians, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Please turn to the end of chapter 3. 
This is the end of the doctrinal part on who we are, how we're saved, the grace of God. And so that part of the book is summed up by great doxology, verse 21 of chapter 3. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And then we go into the practical part of the book. Chapter 4. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. That's our key verse, chapter 4 and 1. Let's pray with the verse before us. Father in heaven, we thank thee, Lord, that this letter was written by Paul, but inspired by the Holy Spirit, so it's the very word of God. And we thank thee, it's not only to that early church in Ephesus, but it is to the church in Macrofell tonight, that this word is right up to date. We ask, Lord, that thou would teach us this week, Bless us tonight in this introductory message, for it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Paul, in chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, I beseech you, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you, walk worthy, display practical Christianity 24-7. That's the subject this week your minister asked me to speak on. And I pray this week you will hear not just the words of Paul or my words, but the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, calling you to walk worthy, to practical Christianity tomorrow night, our behavior, our walk in the church. Tuesday night, Lord willing, it'll be in your speech. Wednesday night, how we ought to live in society. Thursday night, in our families. Friday night in our own personal lives, how we ought to walk. But an important introductory message tonight. Look at chapter 4 and verse 1. I beseech you. Let me ask you tonight, are you one of the you? Are you one of the you? It's bad manners to read other people's mail, isn't it? Are you one of the you or not? That's, that's what we have to make sure tonight. For this book isn't written to everybody. Oh, I know God's word profitable, but I mean specifically it's a letter to a church, to particular people there. Who are the you? Well, the verse tells you. The called. Walk worthy of the vocation. That just means calling. The calling. We're with your call. The called. Are you called of the Lord? Is there a time in your life when God called you unto himself? Well, then you're one of the you. If not, it's our prayer God will call you tonight. Now, in order to be what you ought to be, to walk in practical Christianity as you ought to walk, to walk worthy, as the text says, there's some things you need to note. Just going to mention three. Number one, you need to remember who you were. You need to remember who you were, Christian. What does the text say? The called. What did, call, what did God call you out of? What did he call you out of? What did you used to be? Well, you have to go back to chapter 2 and 1. Chapter 2 is all about what we used to be. And in chapter 2, we're told in verse 1, you used to be dead in trespasses and in sins. And it says that later on in verse 5. Ye were dead in sins. Now, not intellectually, physically, or morally dead. No, even those who are dead spiritually can do acts of kindness. They can. The Lord even said that. Sinners do good unto other sinners. What does it mean? It means we're spiritually dead. When we're born into this world, we're children of Adam, and we, with our mind, we don't know God. Our hearts don't love God, and our will doesn't want to obey God. You see, Adam wasn't like that. Adam and Eve loved God and walked with him. We're not born like that. We are born spiritually dead. In time past, in verse 2, it talks about that's how we used to be. In verse 3, in times past, we all, we all, note it, Christian, don't have pride of grace. If you're saved tonight, it's not because of anything in you. 
Remember as a child, just comes to me, someone said pride of face is bad. Pride of race is worse. But pride of grace is a terrible thing. We're not saved because of anything we did. We all, we all were spiritual dead. As I have a saying in Belfast, we're all baked in the same bowl. <laughs> Every one of us. Oh yes, some may have walked a cleaner life than others, but every one of us, we're all sinners. So I'm saying, remember who we were, Christian. Remember who we were. And time passed. And notice verse 2 of chapter 2. You walked. You walked. You see, we have to walk differently, but you walked. How did you walk? As society dictated. Look at verse 2. According to the course of this world. We just behave like everybody else around us. As Satan directed. According to the prince of the power of the air. We might not uh, uh, knew it, but we were held captive by Satan. And then in verse 3, uh, it speaks here uh, in verse 3, 2, about fulfilling the desires of the flesh. What does that mean? We walked as self-desired. And that's what sin is. Doesn't necessarily mean gross immorality. But sin is living our life without God. Do you ever say, have you heard people say, well, I'll do what I want. I'll live as I please. That's sin. That's exactly what sin is. Going on day by day with no thought of God, with no thought of his will, what he would have me do, that's sin. And we were all like that. We were all like that. Verse 2 says we're children of disobedience. We were disobedient to God's word. I know people say, well, I'm free to live as I want. Well, you're not. Yes, you're free in one sense. It's like a train on two railway tracks. Yes, it's free to go forward or back, but it's, not, it's confined by the tracks. Yes, a sinner without Christ, all we're free to do is sin. We call that total depravity. That's the only freedom we have. Now you think about that. If you're dead spiritually, and we are, there's not a thing we could do to save ourselves. Isn't it sad that you meet people and you say to them, do you hope to go to heaven? Well, I hope I'll be good enough when I die for God to bring me to heaven. You won't. <laughs> you can't. Because we're not only sinners, we're dead. We need to be made alive. We're dead. And that means there's nothing you can do tonight to save yourself. But I love verse 5. Sorry, verse 4 there. Isn't it wonderful? But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us. That means made us alive. Remember who you were, Christian. Have you had a time in your life when God made you alive? You got spiritual life. That's what salvation is. It's not turning over a new leaf. God gives you new life. You're born again by the Spirit of God. By grace, you're saved. It's repeated in verse 8. So, the you in chapter 4 and verse 1. You're called to walk where? They, who are the you? Those who were dead, just like everybody else, sinners like everybody else, but God has made you alive by His grace. Can you have a testimony like that tonight? Remember who you were. Ah, but secondly, remember who you now are. I should say, recognize who you now are. Do you know who you are? Do you? Now, I'm not just trying to be funny tonight, but do you recognize who you are tonight, Christian? You say, well, my sins are forgiven. Listen, salvation is a lot more than having your sins forgiven. Do you recognize who you are tonight? Well, back to our text, chapter 4 and 1, you're called. You're called out of death, spiritual death. You're called to what? To what? Well, I have three main things to say. Go back to verse 1 of chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints... Not a wonderful word. It occurs nine times in the book. Actually uses a term called to be saints. So 
the you who are the practice Christ, practical Christianity, I'm asking, are you one of the you? Well, if you're one of the you, yes, you recognize you were a sinner, dead. But then you recognize I'm different. God has done something. He's made me a saint. Now, we'll have to stop there for a minute, sadly, because of the crazy notion the world has and because of the way the Church of Rome has infected people's minds and other liturgical churches. Saint. So this letter is to the saints at Ephesus, to the saints in Macrofelt. Are you one of the saints here? What is a saint? Well, I remember hearing a story. I'm sure it's only a made-up story. But the story I heard many years ago was a certain small town, and there was a man who was the worst criminal in the town, spent all his adult life in and out of jail, robbing the elderly, embezzlement. You name it, he did it. The worst in the whole town. Somebody told the minister one day that man had died. And the man came to see him in his house. Can I talk to you? Yes. Would you do a funeral? My brother has died. He said, of course I will, but who are you? And he named this man. And the minister thought, oh no. (laughs) He says, well, I'll do it. I never knew your brother. I've heard about him. And then the man said, but at his funeral, minister, I want you to say he was a a saint. (laughs) Minister says, well, I couldn't say that because sure, I've heard about him. In and out of jail, oh, oh, the awful life he lived. Everybody knew him as the worst criminal. They were afraid of him in the town. And then the man said, well, if you say he was a saint during the funeral, I'll give you 10,000 for the building fund. So the minister, certainly I'll do it. So the day of the funeral, he got up and he said, I never knew this man, but I heard a lot about him that he was a terrible in his life. He robbed, he embezzled, he he did, oh, terrible crimes. But compared to his brother sitting there, he was a real saint. (laughs) Hope you got that. (laughs) You know, but seriously, you know why I told that? That's exactly what people think. A saint is somebody who's more holy than others. A saint is somebody who's lived a wonderful life that's far surpasses other people. Rubbish. A saint is not somebody canonized by a church because of their good life. A saint is any individual, man, woman, boy, or girl, who's been cleansed by the blood of Christ. Because all that word saint means is is this, You're separated from unto the Lord. You belong to the Lord. That's what the word saint means. It's related to the word holy. Tonight I'm preaching to the saints in Macrofelt. There's only two classes of people, the saints and the ants. All right? You're either a saint or you're not. And you don't become a saint because you live saintly. You ought to live saintly because you are a saint. All right? I'm dwelling in this, but it's so important. When you're saved, the Lord forgave your sins, but he made you one of his people. That's the wonderful truth. Never forget it. A saint is not a a, a good person. He's just a vile sinner like everybody else who's been saved and come to Christ. But here's something else you are now. You're sitting with Christ. Let me repeat that. You're sitting with Christ. We better look at it, chapter 2 and 6. Chapter 2 and 6, in chapter 5, I remind you, Paul said, you were made alive, that's quickened us together with Christ. But look at verse 6. When you trusted Christ as Savior, when you were born again, given new life, God raised us up as from our dead, deadness and sin together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are sitting in Christ. Look over at chapter 1, verse 1. Who was Paul writing to? Saints and faithful, look at the last words, in Christ Jesus. Do you know the word Christian is only used three times in the whole Bible? But do you, if you go down chapter 1 when you go home, 
and mark every time in Christ, in Christ, in whom? In him. That's why I'm asking you tonight, are you one of the, one of the you? Are you in Christ? Was there a time in your life when the Holy Spirit put you into Christ? You're in union with him. Now, that's mysterious. That's hard for our minds to take it in. You see, when you write a letter, you put a location on it. Isn't that right? Well, in chapter 1 and verse 1, it's to those living in the city of Ephesus. That's their geographical location. But their spiritual location is in Christ. You're in Macrofeld tonight. We're all sitting here. That's our physical location. But there are those in this meeting who spiritually are sitting with the Lord Jesus Christ in the heavenlies. Do you know the heavenlies is mentioned all the way through this book if you read it and mark it? Let's just spend a moment or two to try and get this into our minds. Well, what does it mean? You see, you need to know where you sit before you learn to walk. Isn't that right? You need to learn to sit before you walk. You see, because you're in Christ sitting with him, chapter 1, verse 3, look what happens. Chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Here we've got this term again. In the heavenlies, in heavenly places, in Christ. Because you're linked to Christ. Because you're sitting with him. Because God the Father tonight, before you were saved, you were children of wrath, you were doomed. But because you're in Christ now, God the Father looks at you as in Christ. He sees you as perfect. We know we're sinners, but God sees you as righteous. Why? Because Christ is righteous. And tonight, believer, you are blessed. Isn't this wonderful, verse 3? He's blessed us, not everybody. Yes, God blesses the whole world with Rain upon the just and unjust, food, raiment. But this is talking about spiritual blessings. Us. And it's spiritual blessings. Now look at chapter 1, verse 3, Christians. He hath. That's past tense. Notice in verse 3, all. Tonight, Christian, because you're sitting with Christ in the heavenlies, you have already, already been blessed with every spiritual blessing. You have them. I know you may say, but hold on, I'm not, I'm not enjoying them all. You have them. How to enjoy them, that's another message. But you, the verse, doesn't it? Verse 3, you have it in front of you. Christian, you have already been blessed with every spiritual blessings. Where? In the heavenlies. Well, of course we have blessings in heaven and glory. But that's not, it's not restricted to that. How do I know? Well, I'm not turned to it, but in chapter 6, Paul wrote, we war even in this life against principalities and powers in high, literally, heavenly places. Listen, there'll be no battling in heaven. <laughs> I'm talking about the future heaven. There'll be no battling when we die and with the Lord's talk. What do the heavenlies mean? Well, what it means is, Christian, when you're saved you're in the spiritual world. You're with Christ. You're joined to him. Now, the unsaved don't understand that. All the unsaved can see is material, physical. But when you're saved, you know there's a spiritual. That's not so hard to grasp because there's things in this room you can't see, but you know they're there. There are sound waves going through this speaker system. Can you see them bouncing around the room? No, of course you can't. There's a video signal tonight. I can't see the signal, but it's there. Christian, you need to recognize who you are. You're in Christ tonight, and you are already blessed with every spiritual blessing. God has already given them to you. They're yours. You need to grasp that. You are seated with Christ, and you understand that. Put it another way. Christian, you're a citizen of heaven. This is what it means. You don't just belong to this earth you're a citizen in heaven my wife and I lived in the United States for some years just after we're married it's been three weeks after we're married to America to study missionary study and you know every year we had to fill in an aliens card 
with a green alien's card. You're probably saying, well, he doesn't look like a space. No, alien just meant a foreigner. We were residing in the United States. But we were citizens, British citizens. And I'm proud of British citizenship, as Paul was of his Roman citizenship. Yes, as a Christian, I'm proud of my British citizenship. And that's a scriptural thing to be, but that's not our subject. Um, and I was entitled to all the rights and privileges of a British subject. And I had my passport, and it used to say it on it. Subject of Her Majesty the Queen, and warning people not to touch me, or they'd have to deal with the British authorities. But I was an alien there. What am I saying? Believers, saints tonight. You're living here in the Macrofelt area. But you're also living in the spiritual realm. Yes, you're a citizen here. And as a Christian, you fulfill your duties as a citizen. But Christian, you're a spiritual citizen. You're a citizen of heaven. That's why you're to walk differently. That's why you're to walk worthy of your calling. That's why you're to practice practical Christianity every day. That's why you're to be different than those around you who are not converted. You're to stand out as different by your behavior because you are different. You're a citizen of heaven. And of course, in that verse 3 of chapter 1, it finishes with, in Christ, there's the evidence, in Christ. Can you see what Paul is doing? This is why we're emphasizing this. He'll get to the practical. He'll get on how you should live in your home and society and how you should behave. But first of all, he has to get their minds on the Lord. He has to get their minds on who they are in Christ and what they have in Christ. And that's the most important thing tonight, Christian, to realize who you are. To realize who you are. Because if you get your eyes on that, on your spiritual standing, on your heavenly citizenship, well, then the things of this world will grow strangely dim. I heard a story of a military pilot was testing out a plane that hadn't been complete completed inside the cockpit. In other words, wires were still there. The panels hadn't gone in. He went to test it, and he was going, and he suddenly looked down, and to his horror, he saw a big fat rat <laughs> had got into the plane, and it was chewing on the wires. Can you imagine the pilot? He's testing this plane, and there's a big rat chewing away on the wires. What did he do? Well, he had the oxygen mask on. So he knew what to do. Put the plane into a high, you know, right up, way beyond where you, you couldn't breathe without the oxygen mask on, and the rat died. <laughs> he went up. What's the point? Paul is getting the believers to lift their minds up to see who they are in Christ, to see their blessed God, and then all the sinful pleasures of that great temple of Diana, one of the wonders of the Wayne world that people would travel miles to see, it would look pathetic to them when they saw what they had in Christ. That's how you overcome sin. Christian, overcoming sin isn't you trying and you're gritting your teeth, I will try not to get angry this way. That's not how we live the Christian life. There's only one person can live the Christian life. You know that? And that's Christ. Only Christ can live the Christian life. Now, he lives it through us. And yes, we have a choice of, to submit to him. We're going to talk about the fullness of the Spirit one night. That's letting him control your life. But get your eyes upward. Get your eyes upward. Do you recognize who you are? That's the question. Just very quickly in chapter 1, look at some of the blessings. You say, well, what are these blessings that I already have? Well, isn't it, isn't it wonderful in chapter 1, verse 4? Can you imagine a slave hearing this read? According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. What? You mean God chose me? Me and nobody? Me who's not important? Yes, Christian, isn't that wonderful? Does that not thrill you every day you get up that God chose you? 
And he goes on, oh, I wish I had time for these. And notice he chose you so that you would be holy, so that you would live practical Christian life. And he goes on to talk of wonderful ones here, verse 7, how we're redeemed by his blood. We have forgiveness. Just for time, verse 11, we have a great inheritance. You're rich. You're rich tonight, Christian. I remember doing in the church in ours when I went through Ephesians years ago, I got a lot of boys and girls up to the front and they're all holding letters spelling Christian. Then we got one of the elders to mix them up. You know, the letters. You know what the spell? The letters of Christian, rich saint. <laughs> if you're a true Christian tonight, that's what you are. You're a rich saint. There are some of the blessings, but I'll just stay for a moment in verse 5. Bear, bear with me. We're talking about how rich we are. The adoption of children, verse 5. Do you notice that? Actually, in the original, it's not children, it's sons. Because girls could never be adopted. You listening? Girls were never adopted. So you know this isn't talking about the adoption that we have today. It's nothing to do with adopting a baby or a child, which is a great thing, of course. It's not talking about that. Those Ephesian Christians knew they were talking about. Let's just spend a moment to explain it. Adoption was a legal act where a rich person named their heir and successor. And when that legal act, you can imagine a court, it's a legal process. That had to be a man, you know, a young man growing up, not, not a little boy, but he had to reach young adulthood at least. It didn't necessarily have to be a biological son. It could be somebody else. And they were now entitled to use the name. And they were entitled to all the wealth. They shared in all the wealth of the person who adopted them. Let me bring it a little bit easier to understand. I love July and August for various reasons. <laughs> Great months. All right? Get a bit of exercise in July and August. Uh, do you ever think of where, why we call those months that? July, Julius Caesar. You've heard of him, I'm sure. Well, do you know what Julius Caesar did? And these Christians would have known about this. They knew what adoption meant. Julius Caesar sent word for his great nephew, Gaius Octavian, to be brought from the army where he was serving. Now, Julius Caesar had a biological son, but he called for his great nephew to come to Rome. And they went through the legal process of what this word adoption. His name was changed. Gaius Julius Caesar Octavius. He got a new name. He was now entitled to all the wealth of Julius Caesar, the ruler. And when Julius Caesar died, he became, and it's in the Bible, Luke chapter 2, Caesar Augustus, August. That's what the month August is named after. Why? Why did he become the great Caesar? Because he was adopted by Julius, July, and shared in his wealth. Well, <laughs> these believers knew that, but they're sitting there hearing it. God, the almighty God of heaven, he's adopted you. Our catechism talks about that, of course. Maybe the young people are studying it. What is adoption? You're entitled to all the rights and privileges of the sons of God. That's what it means. You're rich. You're rich. And that's why I can say you share in Christ's everything Christ has. This is who you are, Christian. Do you know tonight you're a saint. You're separated unto the Lord. You're sitting with Christ. That's how God looks upon you. And you share in all that Christ is and all that he has. You read later Romans 8 and 15 where Paul uses the same term. He says, you're adopted. And then in verse 17, you're an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Now, we don't do that today in wills, do we? 
See, a joint heir doesn't mean that child gets so much and that child. No, it means they get it all each. Of course, we know in human beings what they are. Wouldn't there be problems? There'd be fights. It all belongs to both of us. Well, the word is used of you, Christian. Isn't this amazing? When you were saved, it doesn't mean God just forgave your sins. Thank God he did. Thank God you'll never be in hell. But you know, you've been raised to this position of sharing all that Christ is and all that he has. And you've already been blessed with these things. I remember one time, it may have been near Christmas, I think it probably was, I got little boxes. Forgiveness, redemption, access to God, eternal life, and so on. These are wonderful blessings. And then I gathered them all up and I put them in a big cardboard box, closed the lid, turned the lid round. You know what it said on it? The Lord Jesus Christ. See, what it means is, do you ever say as a Christian, I wish I had peace. I wish I had joy. Oh, I feel my sin. I wish I had righteousness. You already have them. Say, but I don't feel... It's in Christ. My peace I give unto you. My joy I give unto you. Christ has made unto us righteousness wisdom. Now, we may not be enjoying them through unconfessed sin in our life, through not knowing what we have, through not walking with him. You see, the problem is you can own something and not know you own it. Maybe you've never been told that you have righteousness in Christ, that he is your righteousness, he is your wisdom, he is your joy. The more you get to know the Lord, the more joy you'll have, as he is our joy. In fact, you know at this moment what Christ is praying for the saints here in Macrofeld? You put your name in here tonight, Christian. You know you're really saved. Do you know what your Savior's praying at this moment? You read John 17. One of the things, Father... I will that they be with me one day where I am, that they may share my glory. But he's also praying, Father, keep them from the evil one. And he's praying, Father, that my joy may be fulfilled in them. Christ is praying tonight, Christian, that you would know his joy in your life. That you would know his joy. So you can own something and not know you have it. You know the story of the man on the boat emigrating from here away over to America and he managed to pay the fare, little money over, so he got some cheese and some bread. But by the time a few days in the boat it got stale, he had no food, he was really hungry, so he went to one of the staff. How much would it be to buy a meal? Just one meal. I'm starving. So the purse or whatever it was looked at his ticket. Do you not know when you bought the ticket, the meals come with it? <laughs> you could have had the meals all along. And Christian, that's sometimes like Christians, isn't it? We don't know our blessings and we don't enjoy them. We don't know what they have. I know another problem. You can own something and not enjoy it. I remember reading some years ago of misers. Garbage Mary is one of them. I'll not tell you about her. But Hetty Smith was the, the classic miser in the States. She died in 1916. They say she was so miserly, she only would eat cold porridge. She would heat a batch, but she would never reheat it. Just ate it cold, but she didn't want to spend money on heating the porridge. Her son had a leg infection, and she wouldn't pay a doctor. She searched and searched for days until she found a free clinic. And by that time, it was too late to save the son's leg. She lived in abject poverty. And when she died, they discovered she was worth a hundred million. And I'm talking way back in 1916. She lived like a pauper. Christian, is that you? Do you know what you have in Christ? Are you enjoying it? Well, how can we live practically as a Christian? Remember, walk worthy. Remember who you were. But God called you. Remember what God called you out of. Recognized who you are now. God has called you to be one of his people. To sit with Christ, a heavenly citizen. To share his glory. Isn't that wonderful? All the blessings of Christ are yours. Everything you need to live as a Christian. They're all yours. Well, when you remember what you were. 
Remember who you are in Christ and what you have. Then, back to chapter 4 and 1, you'll respond by being what you are. Isn't that what chapter 4 our text says? I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, therefore, that, uh, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. In other words, live up to your calling. You're a rich saint. Live like it. Live like it. I've called you unto myself. Live for me. Live that holy life. You are holy. That's what the word saint means. Now, live like it. Live like it. Remember who you are. You see, the more you understand who you are in Christ, the more you'll be able to live as you should live as a Christian in Macrofeld. That's why we're spending this message tonight looking at the doctrine before we get into what, how to live practically in the church and in our speech and these things. But you need to know who you are because if you're not one of the you, if you're not one of the you who know that you've been called out of the world unto Christ, then the message is we trust you'll come, but they don't really apply to you. Oh yes, there may be practical lessons this week. There will be when we read the scripture on how we ought to behave. And there may be some people who don't know the Lord will try hard to put them into practice. It might make them a nicer person to be around. But it'll not save them. That's you. It'll not save you. But for those who are saved, this is how you should live. Remember who you are. Don't forget. When I was young, I don't know if this was around Macrofeld, it never would have happened because you're all well behaved. But I vaguely remember my mother would say, Ron, have you forgotten who you are? <laughs> what did she mean? She wasn't asking that my memory lapsed. <laughs> she must have caught me on misbehaving. <laughs> Son, remember who you are. And the Lord would say to you tonight, Christian, remember who you are. Remember who you are. And remember it costs God to save you. It cost the Lord Jesus Christ to go all the way to Calvary. Remember that, what he suffered. Think of what he suffered for you. He suffered not only at the hands of evil men, but in those three hours of darkness, your hell, your iniquity was laid upon him. And no one can delve into the depths of what Christ suffered to save you, Christian. Never forget what it cost your Savior. When you think of the cost, then you will say, when you survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, then you'll say, Lord, take my all. Take my all. I want to live. What you'll say is, I want to live for the Lord. So I plead with you tonight. Remember what you were. Recognize who you are. Reflect upon the cost your Savior paid to save you. And therefore I plead with you, in light of that, seek to come this week to learn how to live in all these areas of life. And remember, when we get discouraged just like the unsaved, or we fall into temptation of sin like the unsaved, you know why the reason? We've forgotten who we are. We've forgotten the resources that are in, in Christ. Never think, just as I finish, if I live simply, well, then the Lord will love me more. No, he can't love you anymore. You ought to desire this week to live practical Christian life because the Lord does love you with an everlasting love. Here's a phrase. Think upon it this week. Holiness in other words, practical Christianity, walking worthy, is not the way to Christ. Holiness is not the way to Christ. Christ, knowing him, is the way to holiness of life. Never, never get it back to front. And so I trust you'll pray tonight. And I thank you for listening to this introductory message, but I trust you'll pray. Lord, help me to realize what I've been saved from. And that I'll recognize who I am in Christ. Lord, that this week I would respond by desiring to walk worthy so that God will be glorified. May the Lord bless his word.
Thank you, brother, for that word tonight, and our hearts have been encouraged. And if you've been challenged tonight as a, an unsaved person in this meeting, and you would like to be saved, well, then we encourage you even now to bow your head and call on the Lord. But if you'd like to know more about what exactly it means to be a Christian or how to trust Christ as Savior, our brother will be in the hallway after the meeting. Do mention that to him, and he'd be glad to point you to Christ. We're going to sing about our Savior just in their closing hymn, number 95, Man of Sorrows, What a Name. And we have been thinking about what Christ has done, what we have and who we are in Christ. And surely our response today should be hallelujah, what a saviour. So we'll stand together and sing this and then remain standing for prayer. together in prayer. We thank thee, O God, our Heavenly Father, for the privilege of being in this meeting tonight and for being under the sound of the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for this consideration of who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ tonight. Oh, Lord, forgive us for the many times we have lived in spiritual poverty because we haven't uh, come to thee, Lord, pleading those promises that are so freely given to us. We pray, Lord, that thou will give us that grace and wisdom Lord, to ever plead the promises of God. Amen. Lord, we thank thee that there is the peace of God that passeth all understanding. We thank thee that the joy of the Lord is there, that is our strength. Thank you, Lord, that there's that cleansing in those times when we feel and we fall, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. And, oh, Lord, so much more. And therefore, we pray tonight that we will leave realizing something more of the privilege of what we have in Christ tonight. Lord, we sing as we have just been singing. Hallelujah. Amen. What a Savior. Lord, here are we that you would think upon us, but we rejoice, Lord, that you did and gave your Son, shed his blood that we might be saved tonight. We pray for any in this gathering or watching online who are not able to say that they are saints. Oh, Lord, that they're not saved, that they never repented of their sin. But Lord, we thank thee that the, the arm of our Savior is still outstretched to the whosoever. Thank you, Lord, the mercy of God is still uh, flowing, it's still free. And we pray, O oh Lord, and thank thee that the blood has still got power to cleanse from every sin and stain. Therefore, Lord, we pray that you'll give grace for sinners to call upon the name of the Lord that they might be saved 
tonight. Bless us, Lord. May the tide rise. We've been blessed tonight, but we long for more. Night after night, may we meet with Christ, even in this word, for we ask it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen.